everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for the third part of our speaker series. Um, I'm Nikki Hurst Cook from Loyola Project for the Innocent. Uh, I just want to quickly introduce the format and then I'll hand it over to our moderator. There will be time at the end for questions and answers, so please start putting in your questions in the Q&A field on Zoom. Uh, and please note that views expressed today by our speakers, question askers, and moderators may not be reflective of those of the Project for the Innocent or the DA Accountability Coalition. Now please allow me to introduce Paula Mitchell, who will be our moderator. Ms. Mitchell is the Executive Director of the Alarcon Advocacy Center and Legal Director of the Loyola Project for the Innocent. She is widely known for her expertise in appellate work, groundbreaking scholarship on capital punishment, and her long 10 years of federal court judicial law clerk on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Ms. Mitchell, thank you very much, and I hand it over to you. Thank you, Nikki, and welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining our discussion today. Today happens to be National Wrongful Conviction Day, so we are extremely fortunate to have this distinguished panel of attorneys uh, who are going to try to teach us all they can about um, wrongful convictions and conviction review. There are now 2,674 documented cases of wrongful convictions and exonerations nationwide that have come to light since 1989. The individuals wrongfully convicted in these cases have collectively spent 23,950 years in prison serving time for crimes they did not commit. Our project alone has uh, obtained or helped obtain the release of 12 individuals either because their convictions were overturned or because they warranted relief on other grounds. These wrongful conviction cases are proof positive that the criminal justice system is broken. Our system of mass incarceration does not effectively serve justice. It doesn't effectively promote public safety, and it disproportionately harms communities of color over policing, overzealous prosecutions, and the imposition of unnecessarily long sentences and the longstanding culture of denying parole to those individuals who have served their sentences have all led us to this point. This speaker series that we've had this month has brought uh, together attorneys, forensic experts, activists, formerly incarcerated individuals, all to discuss possible reforms and strategies for advancing toward a system that promotes public safety and addresses the system's many inequities. Today we're going to hear from three pioneering attorneys who are advocates for a better system, advocates for wrongfully convicted, and who are all seeking to imagine a more just criminal legal system. First we have Patricia Cummings, who is the supervisor of the Philadelphia District Attorney's Conviction Integrity Unit. Philadelphia DA Larry Krasner took office in 2018 and tapped Ms. Cummings to head up the unit. Under her leadership, the unit has grown in size and renown and has already exonerated 14 people. Ms. Cummings previously led the Dallas District Attorney's Conviction Integrity Unit. She also worked at the Texas Innocence Project and is a former defense lawyer, prosecutor, and lecturer at the University of Texas at Austin School of Law. Marissa Bluestein is the Assistant Director at the Quattrone Center for the Fair Administration of Justice. Ms. Bluestein was the Legal Director and then Executive Director of the Pennsylvania Innocence Project. During her tenure, she built the organization into a statewide leader in criminal justice reform and spearheaded successful efforts to reverse 14 wrongful convictions. Under her leadership, the organization also worked with law enforcement throughout Pennsylvania to, to promote evidence-based techniques to prevent wrongful convictions. Ms. Bluestein is also a former defense attorney with the Defender Association of Philadelphia and litigation associate at Duane Morris. George Gascon is candidate for Los Angeles County District Attorney. Mr. Gascon was most recently District Attorney of San Francisco. He's a Cuban immigrant and an Army veteran who was raised in Southeast Los Angeles. He began his career as an LAPD patrol officer and later became Assistant Chief of Police. Then in 2006, he was tapped to be Chief of Mesa Police Department in Arizona, where he squared off against Sheriff Joe Arpaio and anti-immigrant groups. In 2009, then Mayor Gavin Newsom 
appointed Mr. Gascon to be San Francisco's chief of police, where he worked until he became the district attorney when Kamala Harris when Kamala Harris's seat was vacated. He was the district attorney in San Francisco until leaving office in 2019. Thank you all for being with us today. We should also just note that we invited Los Angeles County District Attorney Jackie Lacey to be with us today, but her office did not reply to our invitation. So before we get started, I just want to take a second to lay, uh, set the stage a little bit. When we talk about wrongful convictions, what we're talking about are cases where individuals are in prison, many of them for decades, and they're claiming that they are innocent of the crimes for which they were convicted. They are largely, almost exclusively indigent. They have no money to hire an attorney. They have very few options. One option uh, is to reach out to organizations like ours, innocence projects like ours. And another option they have increasingly in jurisdictions where DA offices have review units is to reach out directly to those offices and ask them to take another look at their case. So with that background, I'd like to ask, start with Patricia and Marissa. Can you please describe for our audience what a review unit does or a conviction integrity unit? Are they the same thing? What is their mission? What does the review process look like or what should it look like? Patricia? That's a tough question because there's a lot of parts to it. Um, and I'm sure that whatever I leave off, Marissa will fill in. Um, I, I gotta say that the mission of a conviction integrity unit is pretty much standard across the country. And right now, the number of conviction integrity units we have in our country is about 60. Um, Marissa will tell me she monitors it, I think, on a regular basis because it's evolving so quickly. But we, we have about 60 of them, and I think most people would agree that the mission is to have prosecutors who are specialized in looking at cases where somebody was convicted in the past, and there's a question as to whether or not that conviction is a just conviction. Um, that's about the only point I think of agreement for most conviction integrity units, because even though the mission is the same, I think most of us set out to handle it quite differently. And we do that um, because oftentimes we're combined, confined by the law of our jurisdiction, but even beyond the law, I think a lot of times we're confined by the elected district attorney and what they want to do in trying to fulfill the mission or the stated mission of a conviction integrity unit. So to try to just come back and put it as succinctly as possible, you have on the one hand some units that are very broadly focused where they are willing to look at claims of actual innocence, wrongful conviction, and also sentencing inequities. On the opposite end of the spectrum, you do have some units in the country that are very narrowly focused in trying to achieve the mission, and that is they will only look at cases where there are credible claims of actual innocence. And I think anybody doing this work for any period of time, particularly Paula, understanding that you said oftentimes the claims are made by people who are unrepresented, will understand that if you're just looking at that narrow group of cases, it's a pretty dark daunting task. And so some units that do that probably don't have a whole lot of work in terms of trying to achieve the mission. I'm, I'm going to try not to hog the time. I'll shift it over to Marissa and let her fill in now where I've left off. No, hog away by all means. So um, thank you everybody for having us, us with you. So um, kind of picking up a little bit where Patricia was, was talking. I, I mean, first I did check this morning. There are about 75 units now across the country. And it does seem that every day, if you, if you have a Google set like I do, to look for these units, they, they are coming up more and more and more. Um, and yes, they are reflective of what the elected wants to do with it. And it, it is completely driven by that purpose. So there's a difference between mission and purpose. So the mission, I would say, is very much driven by the elected and, and what their vision is for this in order to look at potential wrongful convictions, ensure that convictions do have integrity, where you're going to be looking potentially beyond <clears throat> cases of alleged actual innocence to cases where the prosecutor has lost faith in the conviction uh, due to a number of, of potential issues, constitutional issues, prosecutor um, or police misconduct or, or other matters that can arise in a review. 
But I would say the purpose of a unit is very different. And when done well, like they do in Philadelphia, a unit actually can be the heart of the office, where it's about looking in the past to rectify wrongs that happen, but it's also about looking forward, using the lessons that are gained by looking at wrongful convictions. How do we address charging? How do we address appeals? How are we looking at investigations? What we learn from you know, investigating and correcting wrongful mistakes from the past informs how we go forward. And it also informs how we interact with our community, what is the role of the prosecutor's office with the community, and what does the, the office owe to the community when a mistake is made. So it's, I would say it's even much broader than the uh, looking at the states of the past, if you're going to be talking broader forward in terms of purpose. And that's what we try to, to really promote all around the country. Thank you. So uh, can I jump in real quick? I just want to add something to what Marissa said. I think it's important. Um, it, it's, it's certainly important to talk about purpose, um, but I feel like I have to be super candid. Um, the work that you do in a conviction integrity unit is very difficult and controversial, almost no matter what office you're in. And even though Philadelphia is doing a lot of good stuff, it's still a battle. Um, so when I think about the purpose and I think about learning from the mistakes of the past so that we can make sure we don't repeat them, I have to say that sometimes being able to carry out that purpose is difficult depending on what the culture of the office is like. And even though here in Philadelphia we've got one of the most progressive district attorneys in the country, that culture change is a struggle on a daily basis. And so hopefully the purpose will continue to kind of um, gain traction such that we can actually take what we learn and change it. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, I think some units maybe focus on the purpose and they try to change things moving forward, but they're not willing to look backwards. Um, so being able to be in a universe where you're able to do both is definitely the ideal of any prosecutor's country in the entire country. Hashtag what Patricia said. Thank you. Uh, George, it sounds like they teed this up perfectly for you as uh, potentially the next elected district attorney for Los Angeles County. Have you given any thought to um, where you would like to see the unit go on, on terms of the spectrum that Marissa described where the mission, the, the focus is very, very narrow. We're just looking at one case at a time. Should this case be overturned as compared to let's look at what's wrong systemically. What can we learn from these cases so that going forward, we can do a better job. Yeah, and I'm, you know, I'm listening. I'm taking notes too, by the way. I'm, I'm learning from you guys as we go. And, uh, you know, my intent, if I get elected, is to take the broadest view of the work. Um, and I really appreciated the comment that you made, Patricia, concerning culture. Um, and it's something that I'm probably going to be picking up your brains and Larry if I do get elected. Um, because I know that I'm going to walk into a, a really problematic culture and the largest prosecutor's office in the country. And I actually believe that it's going to be critically important for me if I get elected to bring people that are not part of the office and you know obviously people that bring a great deal of experience as you know both of you have uh, but also you know people that are not so uh, tethered to to the culture of prosecution right i think that's going to be critically important i feel very far uh, fortunate paula that i have you guys in town so you know that i'm going to be really leaning heavily on you for advice and, and your and your group if i were to be elected because my goal really is to create a model unit and a model office moving forward. I think LA has so much to offer, um, but there's a lot of work to be done. I, I definitely think it has to be both a backward looking and a forward looking structure, uh, because if you're not learning from the mistakes of the past, then you're, you're going to repeat them, right? We will continue to have the need to have this backward looks all the time. Uh, and for me, frankly, uh, and this is part of my own evolution. You know, I've been in this system for many years, first of all in policing, but, you know, I was a elected prosecutor slash pointer for nearly nine years. You know, I got elected twice. Uh, and I have had my own evolution in the work, you know, initially being 
um, you know, sort of drinking the Kool-Aid that, you know, we worked really hard to make sure every prosecution was clean. And then, and then, you know, having not necessarily prosecution that occurred during my time, but prosecution that occurred prior to my being the district attorney. And I'm not, no, no persons on anyone else. It's simply, uh, you know, being overturned and, and really, you know, struggling with, the, you know, with what happened, right? And there were not, frankly, there were not cases of, of clear innocence. In fact, you know, there, there were just real questions about witnesses and witness identification, which is usually what's going to be more likely than not what occurred. And having to deal with, you know, the, the struggle of the people that were involved in the case, which I happen to believe, by the way, in, at least in one case in my office, were really earnest in trying to do the right things. I didn't, you know, it's not like that horror story where you're seeing prosecutors hiding stuff. Um, but yet, you know, probably reaching um, to a, you know, to a conclusion that she had was never gotten there just simply because of the mechanics of what happened in the case. Um, and it's, you know, often I think that, you know, most of us, um, when we're thinking of wrongful convictions, you know, you, you develop this thought that it's always going to be this really evil prosecutor and this, you know, and this pure, you know, defense on the other side. But, but I think we all can agree that probably that's the minority of the cases. Right? There's more nuance there generally, there's more gray than, you know, than clear black and white in the work. Uh, I think that the black and white work, hopefully if you're ethical, you, you find it very quickly and you don't have a problem with it. It's, it's when you start walking into the world of greatness, right? Um, and I think it really, uh, you know, to the point that you made earlier, Patricia, having to do with culture, I think it's so critical of the culture because, you know, prosecutors tend to develop a, a belief, as often police officers do, and I'm going to give them the benefit of that. I'm going to talk about the people that are trying to do the right thing, is that, you know, when they move forward, they are sort of holding up the, the banner for goodness, if you will, and they're fighting, you know, bad things, right? And, and so sometimes bending the rules a little seems acceptable, right, within the culture. And that's how obviously you, you, you go from one bad step to greater steps and you have this ripple impact that then you end up with horror stories. So for me, it's gonna be really critically important to bring uh, people that have a, absolutely no attachment to the work and they're gonna come in a, with a high level of integrity and experience but, you know, just, uh, you know, coming in and just being really aggressive about going through and having the capacity to do both backward and forward looking work. Uh, because what I'm hoping to do is also, frankly, because of the sheer size of the office, it's really to create blueprints for, for, the, for the space. You know, I think that LA is that type of an office that can do that. So, I know I put a lot there, Paula, because uh, I'm going to be leaning so heavily on you guys. If I get elected, that you probably wish afterwards that I didn't get elected. <laughs> I, I appreciate your comments. Um, the adversarial nature of the criminal justice system is sort of antithetical to going back and, and reviewing. And I think that's one reason the optics and the structure, the reporting structure of a conviction review unit or a conviction integrity unit is so important. And so I'm curious to hear from um, Patricia and Marissa about their experiences in terms of the reporting structures they've seen within the different offices they've experienced, what sorts of things seem to work and why, and what things are not so good. I'll jump in and I, I forgot to say, I'm just shocked that we went from 60 units to about 75, Marissa. I'm so glad you had that statistic. Um, and it's gonna be interesting because what's happened is the explosion really has been in the last two years. Um, so for the first decade or so, it was a very slow moving train. In fact, a lot of people throughout the country really wondered whether or not conviction integrity units were gonna make it, right? Um, there was a question about whether or not they belonged in a prosecutor's office. And then there was also this crazy notion that we were gonna turn a corner pretty quick and there was not gonna be any other exonerations that needed to take place because DNA would have fixed it all. Um, and so we all know that that, that way of looking at this issue was very, very short-sighted. Um, that's kind of a long introduction into answering your question though, Paula, but I wanted to kind of set the stage because 
with now 75, we will see that the new units should be able to learn from the mistakes that some of the older units have made. And um, I think the structure is critical in order for a unit to be real and to be successful. Um, and I think for me, the most important thing that I've learned having run two different units now is that you've got to have independence in the unit and you've got to have the ability to have the unit report directly, I think, to the elected DA. Um, so let me kind of explain a little bit about what that means and then I'll tell you the problem with not using that kind of back best practice moving forward. Um, a prosecutor doing this work is almost inherently suspect to most people in the community. Um, a lot of people have said asking prosecutors to go look at cases to try to figure out if they made a mistake and then write that mistake is akin to the fox guarding the hen house. Um, so that really has been the attitude about it. But we know now looking at numbers, not only of the units, but numbers of the, the exonerations, that that is not necessarily the case. And I'm gonna tell you, I think the reason why units have kind of exploded as I've described is because of some of the units, the more successful units, understanding the fundamental best practices, which is you've got to be independent. You've got to show that you seriously are going to look at the cases and not be afraid to say when a colleague maybe did something wrong, whether that's a prosecutor or a police officer. And you've got to also make sure that separate from not being afraid to do it, you've got to make sure that you are in a position such that nobody is going to try to interfere with the work that you're doing. One question that I see that comes up a lot with some of the newer units is whether or not decisions about conviction integrity can be made on a committee basis and whether or not that committee often should involve the trial prosecutor that actually prosecuted the case at the outset. And my answer to that is always, oh, heavens no, do everything you can to avoid the committee and absolutely avoid the possibility of a conflict. And that is asking for input from people who actually tried it. Um, so in a nutshell, as I said, I think the most important thing is a direct report to the elected, um, independence and don't make the mistakes of the units that have opted to not go that way and instead make it more of a committee decision, which almost by nature makes it inefficient, but also don't let people get involved in the process that could have been part of the problem to begin with. And, and I want to be careful with that because obviously prosecutors are part of the problem. And so I'm not saying in a general sense, I'm saying in the specific instance of don't let the trial prosecutor play a role. Stay away from your appellate post-conviction prosecutors having input on it because you know what? Something we don't talk about much. It's the appellate post-conviction prosecutors that have been successful for so long in maintaining these convictions that lack integrity. So that's what I would say in response to that question, Paula. How about you, Marissa? So I um, agree with, I think, about 95% what Patricia, uh, her opinions on this, my difference is on the committee issue, which I'll kind of get to in a second. But as far as structure, there's no question that independence is key. And by independence, we absolutely mean direct access to the elected, being able to make independent decisions, being completely outside of the post-conviction you know, slash habeas slash appeals unit. And they're very, very you know, strong, good reasons for that. But the most important is just to have that direct line and that direct communication to the person who's going to make the ultimate decision because it's their ultimate decision. Um, in terms of structure, I would also add that, you know, to me, independence also includes making sure that the person who heads the unit or the people who are in the unit either have direct defense counsel experience themselves like Patricia does, um, or at least have, if they've been uh, career prosecutors, I would encourage them to come from the, the arm of the, unit, the office that prosecutes police officers, or at least have had that experience. So one of Patricia's colleagues um, is a career prosecutor, but he comes from that level. And I find him to be you know, the, of the utmost integrity, of the utmost ability to look and see what these cases are and work with directly. So I don't think it's impossible to have a career prosecutor leading it, but 
you know, if you're going to, it has to be somebody very special, that otherwise it should be somebody who has defense experience. And that's just so that they can see a case from different angles. So if, you, if you're looking at a unit, quite frankly, like LA's right now, which is constituted only of people who have uh, prosecutorial experience, as I understand it, that would raise a red flag that you know, maybe we should be looking at a different structure. On the explosion of units, Patricia's right, this has happened over the last couple of years, but what I find in my work of working with units who are starting or revamping is very often what you see is that it's kind of like, you know, it's not so much a bright, shiny object, but it's almost like the new thing. So you'll get a progressive prosecutor elected, they'll say, oh, we want to set up this conviction integrity unit or conviction review unit, which by the way, are pretty much the same thing. Um, and then they'll hire somebody to do it and then kind of walk away. And then that person's left having to make very, very real decisions about how that unit is going to be run without any direction from the elected. So we really encourage there to be a more, uh, a strong discussion um, so that the elected can be clear about what their vision is, about how they're gonna proceed, what kind of cases are they gonna have, what is gonna be the tipping point for making a decision to reverse a conviction or not. That all goes into the independence level as well. But I think it helps to educate electeds and people who are running for office on these issues about just how complicated they are and what really needs to be done to carry out the vision of that. And the other element of, yeah, of structure to me that's incredibly important is flexibility, that the unit has to have the flexibility to take on cases that they want to take on and make the decisions they want to make based on their review, because they're looking at it from a very different perspective than let's prosecute this. You know, what do we need to do to overcome our burden of proof at trial? And they're now looking at trying to be as objective as possible of where do the facts go? Do the facts support this conviction? And that's, they have to have the ability and flexibility to be able to make those decisions and have a, an array of decisions that they can make and, and different types of outcomes. The only issue in terms of having a committee involved that I think is helpful is that it can be a check on an internal bias for a prosecutor's office. That sometimes even in the most objective of, of pursuits, there, there could be an issue where they want to kind of step outside just to kind of get another view on this to make sure they're kind of on the right track. And that's somewhat the way that Brooklyn does this and, and other jurisdictions that I work with. So it can play a helpful role, you know, but, you know, ceding responsibility or ceding full control, I, I think Trish is absolutely right, that you don't want to kind of take that out. But I do think that there's a role for that. And certainly there's a role potentially for community members somewhere along that line, more likely after an exoneration has taken place and how do we through a restorative justice value bring the community back in and try to heal what has happened with them, with their input. But I would say that's kind of on the other, other side of it. So I think that, you know, yes, there's been an explosion. Yes, it's important. I, I worry though that, you know, when these are, units are being created, it's not being done in a thoughtful, deliberate, purpose-driven way. And it kind of becomes more, you know, uh, wrapping on the gift rather than something that's substantive. And that's where reaching back to somebody like Patricia, who has the, the deep experience to be able to help guide that, uh, that's a critically important aspect of these new units that are developing. Um, Patricia, I just want to follow up with you. Um, you mentioned earlier, you know, that a, a conviction integrity unit can actually become sort of the heart and soul of an office. And when we were talking earlier, you, you mentioned to me one thing that you found helpful, um, whether it's just symbolic or uh, functional, is where your office is actually located. Tell us about that. Yeah, um, so in both jobs in Dallas and Philadelphia, um, my office has always been not far from the district attorney's office. Um, and I think that, you know, symbolically, that means that the district attorney relishes and respects the work of a conviction integrity unit. Um, and then practically, I think it means that there's going to be a lot of communication um, between the district attorney and the conviction integrity unit. That is all important. And I will say um, one thing that everybody needs to be aware of is that the messaging is so critical. And this kind of goes back to what George was talking about and what I talked about briefly, and that is the culture in a prosecutor's office is probably one of the stickiest things to try to change. 
And so if you understand the culture, and, and, and we're talking when, when you said the numbers of exonerations, Paula, understand that that's just been over the last 20, 30 years. So when you think about a culture of a prosecutor's office, you've got to go way far back beyond that. And you've got to understand that traditionally, historically, throughout this country, prosecutors have been defined as those people who really seek convictions. I know a lot of people probably won't like hearing me say that because I think prosecutors, if you ask them, they're going to say, we're not about seeking convictions, we're about seeking justice. But somehow, somewhere along the way, justice and convictions became synonymous. And so understanding that that's been the culture is critical. And even though we've seen over 2,600 exonerations, I would say more often than not, that culture still exists in probably almost every prosecutor's office in this country. Um, so understand that in the context of you bring in a conviction integrity unit and that conviction integrity unit for lack of a better way to describe them is kind of like internal affairs. They're not going to be the most popular people in a prosecutor's office. And so it's super important that when that kind of rift occurs, in other words, when the trial prosecutors are looking at the conviction integrity unit as potentially the enemy, they need to get the message loud and clear from the elected DA, they are not the enemy, they work directly for me, and they are here to make this better, and they are here to say that we are not about just obtaining convictions, really we are about obtaining justice and we all should have a much better idea of what justice is now that we understand and we acknowledge that even though our system may be one of the best in the world, it is broken and we have put plenty of innocent people in prison. And the one thing that I think you will find agreement on with everybody, even though they may not know exactly how to get there, is that nobody, nobody in our office, nobody in our community, nobody in our country benefits when we convict innocent people. Um, Marissa, I have a, a follow-up for you as well. Um, you were talking about there being sort of a division between the post-conviction part of the office that's litigating the habeas claims and the conviction integrity unit. And I'm just curious if um, you or Patricia have any experience or have seen um, situations where it's in court, it's, in, it's being litigated, and as the discovery comes in, it becomes clear that there are bigger problems. Is there, are there offices that have a mechanism to then shift it over to a, a conviction integrity unit out of court, out of litigation? Well, there are actually a lot of kind of very real issues that come up with, with that, but just to kind of take that scenario. So, you know, one thing we, we really don't want to see is if there's been a post-conviction petition filed based on some kind of some low evidence and it's being in litigation, if the prosecutor's office comes in and says, judge, we're going to have our conviction integrity unit look at this, so put this on hold. And so we do, and then they, the prosecutor comes back, you know, uh, several months, even a year later and says, okay, we're good to go now, let's keep going. The judge now has an idea, this is not an innocence case, or there's not something here that they need to be aware of. So it's kind of tricky to manage that in terms of like, once it's been in, in, in litigation to be able to kind of maneuver how that gets handled, particularly with the judge. But in terms of you know, should there be cooperation and discussion, you know, I, I will say it's very, very difficult to do. I know Patricia has a lot to say on this um, it, it, in particular. So it's, you know, if it has been filed already as litigated, that's kind of one thing. If it's in, if it goes through a process of review and, and information comes up, which is potentially exculpatory, which could lead for the person to have to file a petition, that person often doesn't have a choice. The, certainly in a state like Pennsylvania, where if they don't file in time, they lose that ability to ever litigate that case. They have to have that ability to go back into court. So there has to be some level of communication there. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of why that's important, let me, I'll take you back in Philadelphia. So before Patricia came on, before Elaine Krasner was elected, their unit was formed with one individual who was a career prosecutor within the post-conviction unit. We took two cases to them, which they quickly rejected 
both of which wound up being exonerations once Patricia took over because she could see how these cases really came up through and why they were potentially you know, wrongful to begin with. In the process of reviewing that, exculpatory information came to light, which then led to claims of withheld evidence and prosecutorial misconduct. But it's because they were able to look at the case in an entirely different way and view it that they were able to take those two cases, which had been rejected, or we've been told would be rejected if we bring them, to bring them forward in the, in the new light because they were looking at it differently. So I can't emphasize them enough from my own personal experience of being this as a defense lawyer, why that's so critical, because it has to be taken out of that. So yes, there's just the issue in terms of how do we navigate this with, with petitions that are filed and how do we litigate them in court, but there's just such a strong issue in terms of how the office is even looking at it to begin with, if it's still within a post-conviction view. So that brings me to the next topic that I wanted to address, which is cognitive dissonance and confirmation bias. And Marissa, you mentioned the way a case might be viewed or investigated once it gets into litigation is different than the way a conviction integrity unit would look at that evidence. And I'm just curious as to why there are these two models. Are they reconcilable? Should they be two different models? Uh, what does a conviction integrity unit do differently when it comes to investigating or, quote, reviewing a case compared to what would happen by the DA's investigator working for the habeas litigation unit, for example, when they are going out? And I'll just give you a quick anecdote. We, we are working on a case right now. Our um, conviction was overturned. It's not in L.A. County. The, um, the prosecution in this case has gone and investigated uh, and they're considering retrying our client, but their investigation essentially looks like going to talk to the investigating officers and asking them, uh, you know, the, the petitioner is saying that you have tunnel vision. Do you have tunnel vision? No, I don't have tunnel vision. Okay. And then they go on to the next one or there's, you know, and so basically they're basically looking to confirm that everything's fine. There's nothing going on here. That's, that's what, what happens when you're in litigation. So I guess what I wanna hear from you um, both is how is that different when you're reviewing a case in a, in a conviction integrity unit? So I'll start that one and let Patricia take the much better <laughs> answer that I know is coming from her. But on appeal, what the prosecutor is doing is, is looking within the bounds of a statute and the constitutional law and the, and the law that's been developed <laughs> determine are the claims that are being raised valid? Is there a defense to them? If there's a defense, they raise it. I mean, that's just kind of, it's, it's litigation. You are adversaries, you are going at this together. Occasionally you, there will be cases, and I had them when I was a public defender, where the district attorney's office or, or the U.S. attorney's office you know, says, you know what, you're right. Uh, there were, you're, the position you raise is correct, and they will concede that. But generally speaking, the role of the prosecutor is to continue to defend the conviction. That's the job. And that's what they're supposed to be doing. That's what they're trying to do. Whereas once it flips into a different view of conviction integrity, you're looking at it in a much more holistic way. It's not about, you know, are, is there a statutory defense here? Is there a constitutional or common law defense? In fact, a good unit is going to look beyond that. I'm going to review a case regardless of what the statutory objections are. You know, if they're asking for DNA, give them DNA. I don't care that the statute would allow me to defend against it. We're going to do that because that's what justice requires. And that's what an objective view of this case requires. So to me, that's the specific difference and the dissonance between those. Patricia, I, I'd love to hear your comments. And then, George, I'd like to hear yours. I can get it off mute. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think the way that I would probably describe how the biases play a role in prosecutorial decision making is I would try to put it in two, two buckets. Um, the first bucket would be the pretrial bias, um, which generally is going to be what I would call the confirmation bias. It is traditionally the way prosecutors have prosecuted cases is law enforcement brings them the case and surely law enforcement is bringing them cases of guilty people. And so 
prosecutors start with that premise generally, and then everything they look at goes to confirm that in fact that person is guilty. Meanwhile, in the other bucket is what I would say is what you see in the post-conviction setting. Um, and Marissa is right. I mean, I think the, the easiest way to describe what prosecutors see their role as is defend the conviction. So the pretrial prosecutor gets it, the post-trial prosecutor defends it, and I think the bias to best explain how that process works is the cognitive dissonance. And that is, boy, and in, in fact, I think it's actually a harder bias to deal with in the post-conviction world than I think it is in the pretrial world, because think about it. By the time the post-conviction appellate prosecutor's looking at the case, you've had a police officer bring the case saying, this is your guy. Then you've had the, the, probably the charging prosecutor and then the trial prosecutor all saying, yep, that's the guy. Then you've got the trial and you've got a fact finder saying, indeed, that is the guy. And not only is it the guy, it's the guy beyond a reasonable doubt, um, whether that's the judge or the jury. So then by the time it gets to the appellate post-conviction prosecutor, you've got all of these levels that say, boy, this is the person, I need to defend the conviction. And to even think for a minute that that is wrong means that I've got to say all of these other people are wrong. And then the worst thing is, is I've got to say, you know, maybe I've done something wrong because, you know, we know that post-conviction prosecutors sometimes will deal with a case over and over again because you're going to have the direct appeal and then you're going to have collateral attacks. Um, so I really do believe my experience has shown that that bias in the post-conviction world is probably the harder one to dispense with. Then on top of it, let's say you've got somebody coming in and they say that they have a claim of innocence and trying to kind of weed through that defending the conviction and the cognitive dissonance really requires you to have some other type of vision, some other type of lens for looking at it. So you've got to go from that tunnel vision to, I was reading an article today where somebody called it a cavern vision, which is really looking at things very broadly. And Marissa said it's holistically. But on top of that, you've got to have the ability to investigate it. And once again, I'm going to say in the post-conviction appellate section, those people are probably the less equipped or least equipped to actually investigate and go back to square one and say, what happened here? And understand that when you ask the question, what happened here, sometimes it means, you know what, maybe a crime wasn't even committed, much less the question of, did this particular individual commit the crime? So that's kind of how I have experienced dealing with the biases and ultimately why when you look at a conviction integrity unit, you want to staff it with the right people so you don't fall victim to either one of those as much as possible. And let me say, I'm not foolish or naive. All of us as human beings suffer from biases at one point or the other. The idea is we want to get people that either have the experience or the training to try to minimize those biases. And as Marissa said, I think what we all agree on is that defense lawyers traditionally really operate in a world where it's always, let's see how to disprove it rather than proving it. And that's really how a conviction integrity unit needs to operate. Thank you. Uh, George, there's a lot of uh, food for thought here. Um, do you have any thoughts or impressions you want to share with us about what we're learning from no, these? I, I do, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to actually speak from personal experience now, um, and I'm going to tell you actually in the areas where I made mistakes and you know what I would do differently. So to begin with, San Francisco, we created an independent investigation bureau, right, and we tasked them with two things, right. One was to um, investigate uh, allegations of police criminal conduct on duty and to investigate police shootings and to do criminal uh, to do conviction review. And we brought, uh, you know, actually we staffed it with outsiders. We brought in some people that were federal public defenders. So we brought a good mix of people. We brought in people from the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Justice Department. Um, but the first mistake I would tell you is that you should never, if in, given that this seems like a cottage industry that's growing so quickly, I've come to the conclusion you should never have uh, two different 
missions within the unit. Uh, I think looking back, that was a mistake. You know, this sort of became my civil rights unit, if you will, trying to put everything under one umbrella. And in retrospect, that was a mistake. And not because I, I actually believe I had the right people to do either work, but they should have done one or the other, right? The, the conflicting pools of the workloads created, you know, the, the, the here and now, the police shootings and all that stuff, took them away from the other work most of the time. Then, you know, I often use the appellate unit to help with the work. And it goes to the conversations that we've had here. And then another mistake that I made, and, and it was in one particular case, actually it was brought over by, by the Bay Area Innocence Project where, you know, we had kind of a committee review of the case uh, and included all those people. But we also brought in the, the trial lawyer in the case. And, you know, it, it was someone that I respect. I, you know, respected and continue to respect. And I don't believe that, you know, even to this day, I don't believe that she intentionally went to, 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 to move forward with the case that, you know, I'm not sure that the person was not necessarily the assailant, but the evidence was a problem. Um, and, and I started to buy the theory of the original case as we have more and more conversations and we had our appellate lawyers, you know, talking about the case and, and it, you know, and I think that, you know, we wound up, by the way, retrying the case. And, you know, and there was problems with the case retrial. Some evidence had been destroyed, so we lost the case. But it was a great learning journey for me about what not to do. And, you know, one of them was absolutely, you never want to bring the original trial lawyer, no, no matter how much you respect that person, they are too vested in the case and they are not going to be someone that you want to get sucked into their, their theory of the case. I totally agree that the appellate unit is the wrong people to bring to the conversation. And then the other learning uh, lesson for me, I guess it was, and it was really driven by budget, but it's putting too much in a single bucket. Uh, so I would tell you that if I were to be elected, number one, that work will be done completely independently by itself. Uh, by the way, there were direct reports to me, so that was not an issue and everybody knew that that was kind of my, one of my pet peeves. So, I mean, everybody in the office understood how important they were. That wasn't the issue. It was just too much work in one place. Um, so I think that needs to be completely segregated. I think, you know, the people that are hired, I would probably hire them all over again. And then some, uh, but then it's all the other mistakes of, you know, having sort of a committee look at this and having the, the original trial team be part of that process. I think it was a mistake uh, that I certainly would not do again. So, I, I pretty much agree with everyone, but I'm actually telling you, I, you know, I learned through this through my own personal mistakes. Well, I, uh, you know, I can tell you from my experience, I've been um, the legal director of the project at Loyola uh, since 2015. We have taken a number of cases to the conviction review unit. Um, it's been a very frustrating experience. It's uh, for a number of reasons there. We, we can do much better in Los Angeles. We have to do much better. There are half of all the serious felonies in the state of California, roughly, are out of LA County. But just by sheer virtue of the numbers, uh, there has to be uh, the capacity to review these, these claims of uh, wrongful conviction has to be scaled up. The, um, the DA's office currently says that they've reviewed over 1,700 cases and they've found only three that they believe the conviction should be overturned. And in my experience, the, um, the amount of time and effort that goes into reviewing these cases is extraordinary. I'm sort of baffled at how they could possibly have reviewed 1,700 cases in five years. Uh, and also, the cases that we took to the CRU and that the CRU rejected, we have gone on to win in court and had those convictions overturned. So I, I'm all but certain they are not carefully reviewing the, the cases that are presented to them. It's a tremendous missed opportunity. And I, um, I hope that some of the comments that we've heard today uh, provide a catalyst for some, some change and some improvement. Um, I think that we might be ready to go to some questions, uh, Nikki, if we have any. Yes, absolutely. We do have a few um, audience questions we'll start with. Um, the first one I have um, is how should a CRU define success? Is it by exonerations or something else? 
Yeah, I'll start with that. I mean, I have some pretty strong opinions that it should not be exonerations per se. Uh, there's just so many different factors that go into that. Um, that said, if you have a unit that, you're, like LA, has been in operation for several years, they've reviewed 1,700 and they have three exonerations, there you want to look at what is the procedure they're using to be able to get those cases moving. So you're looking at LA, just to kind of keep picking on them. Sorry, George. Um, <laughs> but it's, I, there's some concerns about how, how it's set up. The fact that there are no outside, everybody there is, is prosecutors um, who are doing the review, that's probably a problem because exactly what Patricia said, you don't have anybody with a defense counsel background who's used to kind of tearing things apart or looking at them directly. So I would say a, a better measure of success is how are they flowing cases? Are they, how many resources are they developing? Are they putting into that unit? What are, how many are they rejecting? What are the grounds on which they're rejecting them? How much work and how long does it take them to do a review? Because if it's just looking at the papers and kind of going back and talking to the police officers, that's not a review. That's not an investigation. They're not really looking for it. Are they sharing information with defense counsel? Are they giving them access to the full files? Um, unfettered, which LA does not appear to do based on the information that I have. Um, if once they've given that, are they you know, working with defense counsel to do a collaborative investigation and effort as is done in Philadelphia and Wayne County and other places around the country? You, to me, it's more about the process and how they're reviewing these cases and, and really taking it on as opposed to a metric like exonerations, which I think is very problematic. The other I would add is what effect is the unit having on the office? Are they revising their trainings? Are they revising their Brady, Brady material? Are they revising how they're providing discovery? Is it having an impact on how the office is progressing, which will lead to, as Patricia has been talking about it and just completely correct, a, a culture change and a development of a different culture in the office. So for me, it's, it's absolutely not exonerations. Look at the process, look at the resources, look at the impact. I would just add that in LA, um, we've presented cases where it's not only that they involve the trial prosecutor or the unit that prosecuted the case, it's almost like they have veto power and they will make the ultimate decision. And uh, that, uh, in addition to the fact that with only three convictions overturned, you can't possibly be learning from your mistakes because you're basically saying we haven't made any mistakes. It's just not, it's not a system that's gonna promote uh, progress. The next question is, do district attorney and public defender offices ever have regular meetings where they can discuss post-conviction cases involving questionable convictions where those cases can be discussed and or settled? And I guess I would expand that too, to do district attorney offices meet with other organizations and, um, and groups? And if not, should they? Patricia? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, I, I gotta tell you, I think the answer has gotta be yes. Um, the question really in my mind is how structured is that, number one. And number two, also depending on the jurisdiction, it really is, you know, who, who is the expert on the defense side of doing the post-conviction work and the innocence work? Um, you'll see, in, depending on the size of the jurisdiction, you may even have public defender's offices that don't do the collateral, um, the collateral attacks, the habeas, the post-conviction relief act. So you've really got to kind of know who's, who's the person on the other side how structured does it have to be? And at the end of the day, you bet if it's a real unit um, and you're not defining the success just by exonerations, you certainly should be defining it by how well they collaborate. Um, Marissa mentioned just in passing, I, I, actually I think it's in response to Paula, that when we think of the criminal justice system, we typically think of it in terms of an adversarial system. But what we haven't focused a lot on in this discussion today is that I think really good successful conviction integrity Work is collaborative. And by definition, that means you've got to be sitting at the table with the defense lawyers, whether it be a public defender's office or an innocence project. And quite frankly, it needs to be quite often because it's not just talking about the individual cases that they're bringing to you, but it's talking about 
do you process the number of cases you're coming? How do you prioritize them? How do you work together to try to say, okay, this is a problem we're facing in the courts. How do we fix it? So there's so much to discuss. And I would hope that every conviction integrity unit throughout the country are having those discussions on a regular basis. Mr. Gascon, did you want to jump in there too? Yeah, I mean, in, in San Francisco, we had a, we have regular meetings. So we had meetings where the, and actually in San Francisco, the public defender is elected. So both myself and the elected public defender met and then our staff met not only in terms of conviction review, but procedurally, we would have our training units met regularly. Uh, when we were encountering problems in the courtroom, we would try to come together. Now, I'm not going to tell you it was all rosy and that we always came out agreeing, but we had regular scheduled meetings that occurred every month and sometimes more often. In addition to that, both the, the elected public defender and myself, uh, you know, we actually worked out of the same gym, so we had a very good relationship, but in addition to that, our executive staff work regularly together. Again, not always agreeing, but the accessibility was really important to us. And frankly, I think on a perspective, more than a, more than a uh, looking back, uh, we, we were able to cure a lot of problems before we wound up with uh, bigger problems with a wrongful conviction. So I definitely think it's, it's critical for the defense and the prosecutors to have very good working relationships. And you know, sometimes you're gonna to agree to disagree. That, that is part of the system, but that doesn't keep you from communicating and doing so both formally and informally on a regular basis. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what criteria would you set or what are best practices for who serves in the conviction integrity unit? And should they be people who are permanently in the unit? I jump on that one first because one thing that we've talked a lot about is just having criminal defense experience. So I want to set that aside and talk about some of the other qualifications that I think that you should have in a conviction integrity unit prosecutor. Um, I think ideally you want to have somebody who has 10 plus years experience in the criminal justice system and I think the ideal person is somebody that's done trial work as well as appellate and post-conviction work. Um, it's kind of like my dream um, candidate is somebody that's going to come to the table with those qualifications. When I was in Dallas, it was super important to try to get that because the unit was very small. Um, I've been very lucky here in Philadelphia because Larry has given me more people than I actually ever thought I would have. And so as you get more, I've realized that you could probably say, I don't have to have somebody with 10 years experience. Um, so I, I say that because any unit that is just recently formed ought to be thinking about what's, you know, what are their resources? Are they gonna have two people or are they gonna have five? Because I think depending on the number, you might change those qualifications just a little bit. And finally, to the last point of that question, how long should somebody stay in the position? I, I gotta say, I think, I think my opinion is a little controversial and I've held it since I was in Dallas and that is, I really don't think you should have a chief in um, the position of running a conviction integrity unit for too long. Um, I think that it should be a few years and then it is time to move on because I think it's critical to not get so entrenched in any of the kind of inner workings of the office and the culture. Um, and I also think it's important to bring in new ideas. And so I think that, so you save yourself from getting entrenched, you bring in new people. Um, even though that's my opinion, I will say because conviction integrity units have not been around that long, I'm not so sure that it's something that has caught on. Um, and we'll see if it's something that I actually live up to given the fact that I've been in Philadelphia now for a little over two and a half years. Uh, we are about out of time. So I think we can just go around and everyone you give your last words about, you know, we're focusing now on LA County and what can the CRU in LA County do to become a, a better CRU? 
Sounds like a George question to me. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump. I mean, I, I think uh, that at least in my experience in looking at the LA Conviction Review Unit, I, I almost call it a, a conviction affirmation unit, right? It seems like the work is to affirm uh, the conviction. Um, and I think it's partly because, you know, you have prosecutors in the unit, partly because you do have to have involvement by the lawyers that were involved in the original case if they're around. Um, and that I think is the evidence is there that, you know, only three convictions have been, uh, you know, found to be worthy of, uh, of, of being exonerated uh, out of allegedly 1700. And frankly, I question the 1700 number. I, I just don't, I've personally been involved in looking at a few cases with my team and my God, we spent months looking at one case and it was a large team. I don't know how you have uh, 1,700 cases look for. But the bottom line is that I think quantitatively, I think that that speaks for itself three out of 1,700 then. Obviously, that needs to be done differently. And I agree with Paula that just the sheer numbers that come out of LA, which by the way, are not only because LA is the largest, but proportionally, we, we prosecute more felons proportionally than most other counties in the, in the uh, state. So you can't just hide behind the sites. Yes, we are the larger, but proportionally we just, you know, we go way and above. I mean, let me give you a comparison. We put four times the number of people in LA in prison that we did in San Francisco. So that really speaks volumes to the type of work. I think bringing outside people, uh, obviously as Patricia and Marisa have indicated, they have to be people that know the work um, and they have to come in with a clear uh, you know, a clear mind uh, and not necessarily a patch to the culture of the office is going to be critical. And again, I think it's, it's, it's paramount uh, if obviously if I'm elected that this will be people that will be direct reports to me and that we're looking both backward and forward because I think frankly at the end of the day, the backward part is important obviously. If you've got a person that has been incarcerated rough, wrongfully, we've got to do everything that we can to get him out of there, him or her. But the, the forward looking to me it's the future, right? How do we avoid damaging and harming other people, other families, and other communities? So I think that the forward looking to me is, is critically important as well. And to do all of that in the size of a place like LA, I'm going to need a lot of insight and also I hope to do it. Thank you. Um, we have no more time for questions, unfortunately. So I'm going to hand it back to you, Paula. Okay, well, this has been truly informative. I cannot thank you all enough for joining us, uh, our distinguished panel, as well as all of our uh, audience members. I hope we can have this again next year on Wrongful Conviction Day and check in and see how things are going. Um, I know our project has almost a thousand cases waiting for review. So if that's any indicator of the, of the problem that we're dealing with here in Los Angeles, um, our work is cut out for us. Thank you again and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.